Good afternoon. I'm Michaela Miller with the Thursday edition of the Our City COVID-19 News Show. The National Coronavirus Command Council and the Social Cluster will be briefing the nation on the Level 3 lockdown regulations today. As we anxiously wait on the briefing, many are hoping to get clarity on whether the identified metro hotspots will stay at Level 4 of lockdown or if we will be moving to Level 3 of the lockdown from the 1st of June. The briefing has been postponed twice already. And now for the headlines. Satu Provincial Secretary discusses the reopening of schools on Monday. Lunga Guza from the Lingale to Policing Forum speaks on exercise curfew in Kailicha and we look at the impact of COVID-19 has had on people suffering from the mental health illness during the lockdown. It is day 63 of the lockdown and the current number of confirmed COVID-19 cases nationally stands at 24,264 with 12,741 recoveries and 524 deaths. The Western Cape has 16,551 confirmed cases, 8,504 recoveries and 387 deaths. All provinces have prepared additional beds in order to deal with the coronavirus pandemic when it peaks. Health Minister Zuelim Kizeh said the estimated number of ICU beds was 5,000, but that his department was looking for additional beds in Gauteng and the Western Cape. An arrangement was being made to use private hospital beds and a team was clearing up issues around costs. He said enough personal protection equipment had been ordered. Heavy rains and snowfall on the Western Cape Mountains have left 60 Langa families out in the cold after their homes were flooded. A snowfall hit the Klein Kudu, forcing the closure of major roads and a mountain pass. Cape Town Disaster Management spokesperson Charlotte Powell said the city's informal settlements department would assess and provide flood kits to the affected residents. The SA Weather Service said localized flooding would continue in Cape Town and very cold conditions were expected over the Northern Cape. As the Western Cape Department of Education is preparing to receive Grade 7 and 12 learners next week, Ayanda Nabi spoke to the South African Democratic Teachers Union, Western Cape Provincial Secretary Jovan Rustin, as about issues around in the preparedness of schools for the reopening. Comrade Jonathan, Monday is the day that was set for schools to, us, to, us, to, re, to resume. Um, we've heard a lot from Satu on the news and the papers and everywhere else. Um, and I wanted us to, to, to chat a bit of the state of readiness. Are teachers ready to, consume, to resume their work on Monday? No, thank you very much. I think teachers have been ready uh, to resume work um, for a long time. Uh, but the question should be, uh, are the schools ready to receive the teachers? Uh, and the learners. Mm -hmm. uh, as Cape, we are convinced about that. Uh, we are concerned that schools have not been properly cleaned in this process, uh, that all the PPEs have not been received for learners, and that uh, we have now seen a number of incidents of teachers getting uh, positive for COVID-19. That makes us even more scared about how are we going to deal uh, with this uh, pandemic so once you start teaching and the learners come in, what are your fears in the main? What are you most fearful of? If you could take us through that process. If a, wo a learner walks in, what should um, a parent expect or what should happen for your, for your fears to be, to, be, uh, to be laid aside? Well, I think it's in the province that uh, the Western Cape Education Department has run rush shots and taken shortcuts in terms of cleaning of the schools. Mm -hmm. uh, in other provinces, we see that there's been a process of deep cleaning where companies have put in, put in uh, to ensure that uh, there's compliance with the Department of Labor 
and the Department of Public Service and Education Regulation for that. In this province, we see that the department has used the internal staff. Um, mm. So, um, pictures, right off the walls, etc. We are not uh, very uh, much convinced that this compliance with what uh, the Department of Labor's regulations is saying. Now, when a, a learner arrives at school on Monday, that learner is supposed to be screened. In this province, there's not uh, been a dedicated screen to be uh, appointed. It's expected of the teachers to stick to the learner. So the learner's temperature should be taken. Also heard that some of the monitors have been malfunctioning as we have been uh, screening, sorry, screening the, the teachers and giving inaccurate reading. Then four questions have been asked. Uh, we have a fever, we have a cough, we have a body ache, head ache, and so forth. And that those questions need to be answered. Then learners and should be sanitized and they use a uh, cloth. Now, here comes the tough one. Uh, learners should be spaced at least 1 meter, 1.5 meter apart. And the, the size of our classes, even if they have to be held, it means that um, the classroom may be too small and we may have to struggle to do a timetable in the time. Table Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, one thing I'm curious about, I'm looking at the school itself, the building. Um, I'm wondering if many of our schools, or at least if you have an idea how many of our schools are ready to receive um, workers, which will be the teachers and, and the learners at the same time. I'm thinking in terms of social distancing. Um, I hear that there are efforts that will be made to ensure that learners keep their distance. I would want you to talk to that. And again, I'm concerned about social distancing between the teachers. Do you have staff rooms big enough to allow that social distancing? Definitely not. Staff rooms are not uh, big enough to host uh, 50 people in one space uh, to observe social distancing. Then we have the concern of how do staff be close up in between? Do they have uh, an on hand sanitizers? able to clean the machines and clean their hands before they touch the surface. Now, what's important is in COVID is that uh, what um, the, the process repeat means that uh, the entire day there should be a clean process, a cleaning of the rails, of the staircases, cleaning the door handles, uh, making sure that learners are social distance to take around. And now we're hitting winter. And I'm fearful to think on Monday that when we must screen uh, our learners and they're standing one to five meters apart um, in the rain, how are we going to ensure that learners are safe, learners are dry, uh, when out we do and uh, they see the little school. And start to Western Cape, we are not convinced that the department is ready. We think we should have had some more time to ensure that our buildings are compliant, that everything's in place, we have, uh, and how uh, that uh, we have sufficient masks uh, and that we orientate our parents first before we orientate our parents. You know, a very interesting issue came up when we were trying to speak to teachers who are, of course, quite fearful of appearing on camera was that, um, you know, even our medical aid is not ready to receive us. You know, if we were to be um, infected, the type of medical aid that government gives us um, we'd probably have to make huge contributions for health purposes. Is that even true? We'd like to hear from you. Do you think, um, um, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid to mention the name on air, but um, teachers have been very clear to say that government medical aid that we receive might not be able to cater for our needs should we be infected with COVID-19 as teachers in schools. Well, um, I know that the medical aid has seen out some uh, uh, publications to say that they will cover uh, costs for, for those affected with, uh, with COVID-19. I made a personal inquiry about testing, for example, um, to ensure that before I return to work that I get tested. Uh, they said there has to be a referral from a doctor. Uh, to so I'm not sure if the medical aid or the they know that the public health system is under severe pressure to deal with the current cases we have in the problem. And if we send uh, 30,000 people to the field 
and we think you know, but maybe 200,000 learners in schools on Monday, we can imagine what the, a huge impact it will have on the current stretched health system we have. And we think that the plans developed uh, are not comprehensive. We are not saying that schools should not close or uh, open at all, but we think that maybe it should have waited a bit uh, so that we have workers go back to work and we phase in uh, schooling at the level. You know, what I think, um, uh, Comrade John, that this COVID-19 has exposed in education are the gross inequalities we've been talking about. That, you know, when I went to school, and I know at least when my nephews go to school, the teachers still share dust. Um, I don't know what are your plans are as teachers and the Department of Education to sanitize the books that will be distributing to these learners. Have you thought about all these logistics? Because one would think that these are things that should have happened. I mean, we don't have much time. Monday is just around the corner. In well, as the union, we've been saying that we need to ensure that learners do not share books. Learners do not share equipment like pencils and pens. Uh, learners have social distance. Uh, they do not um, um, hug and fight and chase each other, uh, steal each other's mask at school. Um, and intervals may be a, a total Challenges in the system. I mean, the inequalities are are huge. We know that wealthier schools uh, could get in uh, companies to disinfect the, the building. They could probably get the companies to disinfect the regularly, um, in line with what the, our provisions are. But poor schools do not have the luxuries, and that the majority of schools in the poor schools and the working class will be affected once again with this inequality in the education system. Yes. Well, you know, Comrade Jonathan, thank you so much for your time and the explanation um, of what the fears are that teachers have. As unions, parents and learners are anxious on schools reopening, founder of One South Africa Movement, Musi Mamani, is taking the government to court as he believes the decision to reopen schools was premature. What is most crucial is the fact that South African schools uh, are expected to open on Monday. But, and our challenge simply is that the schools are not ready. We've consistently argued the case, and 160,000 parents signed an online petition on us to say that this, they cannot allow their kids to go back to school. I then wrote to President Ramaphosa as the chair of the National Coronavirus Command Council to say this decision you must satisfy all citizens with the rational reasons why for this administrative action. And it became very clear that the government does not have rational reasons, that in fact, more than anything, when we reflect, they have failed to comply, to compel us with those, and we are not willing to put our kids at risk by allowing them to go back to schools where potentially many of them could contract the virus, spread into our communities. And so our call was simple to say we need to take court action against this particular government. Uh, Advocate Dalumpo will be leading a team. And uh, our argument simply is this, is that the 1st of June is premature. Schools are not ready. We are asking for a supervisory you know, uh, order that will give an independent body a right to assess what happens in a school so that they can certify that the schools are ready to be open. We are also asking the Department of Basic Education to go and fix the schools. Ultimately, the schools that don't have running water, the schools that don't have PPEs, the schools that don't have um, uh, transport for learners so that our learners are not being transported to schools like sardines, that we have alternative venues so that we don't have overcrowded classrooms. And uh, we are asking people to help us fund that legal case because it's about time we get an education that works for all citizens. So the call is for that legal case uh, for people to contribute to it. They can crowdfund it. They can go on the website, change.org, make a contribution, but also to make sure that they continue to sign the petition. The National Transport Department has given the city of Cape Town the go-ahead to reopen driving license testing centers in the metropole. As these centers are traditionally very busy, it would have to update safety protocols. 
the city said a 90-day grace period would be in place for documents that expired during the lockdown period, including driver's and learner's licenses, temporary permits, professional driving permits, roadworthy certificates, the registering and licensing of a motor vehicle, as well as annual renewal. Staff members at juvenile detention centres in the Western Cape have tested positive for the dreaded coronavirus. To date, 18 cases have been confirmed, with seven recoveries reported. 11 cases were recorded at Bonnie Town Child and Youth Care Centre, three at the Horizon CYCC, two at Cryfontaine Raw and Treatment Centre, one in Lindelani CYCC and one in Friedelis CYCC. Spokesperson for the Provincial Social Development Department, Joshua Chikome, said the facilities in question were fully compliant with departments of public service and administration and labour. Out of the total 18 staff members who tested positive for COVID-19 across all child and youth care centres in the province have already returned to work. As of yesterday, there has been no resident that has tested positive for COVID-19. All facilities are fully compliant with the DPSA and the Department of Labour requirements, and the Department of Labour has been monitoring the situation to confirm this. Measures have been put in place in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. These measures include sanitising these facilities three times a day, every day of the week, sanitising of the vehicles, the provision of um, PPE for all staff, when we come back, we will touch on dealing with mental health issues during COVID-19 and how the policing forums in Kailicha have enforced social distancing while people exercise. Stay tuned. Welcome back. You're still tuned into Channel 263 on the DSTV of Tuesday edition of the Our City COVID-19 show on Cape Town TV. Under Level 4 lockdown regulations, exercise was permitted, but only between 7 and 9 a.m. On the first day of Level 4 lockdown, thousands flocked to Seapoint Promenade and various public spaces to exercise with no practicing proper social distancing. Lookout Hill in Kyalicha is a gathering place for exercise and with Kyalicha being one of the hotspots for COVID-19, community policing forums took action to ensure social distancing was enforced. We spoke to Lunga Guza from Lingale to Policing Forum. Okay, uh, my name is Lunga Guza. I'm from the Lingale to Community Policing Forum. Um, as leaders amongst Kailicha, um, from all areas actually in Kailicha, we were shocked to see, um, uh, I can safely say thousands of people gathering next to Lookout Hill between um, nine, um, six and nine in the morning. Um, we all know that we are under a lockdown and um, the presentation by the president um, including the ministers, uh, sort of allow, you know, people to be out there, you know. Um, most of them, they would say they are joking, but um, when you get there and you look at some of the activities that are happening, it's not um, related to exercising or jogging, you know. Um, so it was, it was really, um, you know, an extreme situation where we could not really understand. But when we started speaking to some of them, we gathered the fact that um, most of them, it's young people and children. I mean, um, from the ages of seven up to older people, you know, that were there, that were part of um, jogging. Some of them, it's leisure time for them because it's locked down. Some of them, it's exchange of dogs, because uh, we saw a trade of dogs happening there. Some of them, they meet girlfriends and boyfriends there. Some of them, you know, it's just the time to leave your house and be not be under the guidance of your parents, for example, or siblings. Those are the things that we gathered there. And um, lastly, there's an open field also there where they were playing soccer. 
you know, it was more like a competition from different uh, people from different areas having soccer while uh, many others were watching. Look, it's, it's, it's very difficult because one would know that even the CPF itself, it's not supposed to be out there and um, enforcing law um, uh, because we are not given, you know, that role. Um, the made Minister of um, Police basically made it clear that um, CPFs are not allowed to operate. But because these are the same children who come back to our homes or these, some of them are our neighbors, we, we took that time because that time is allowed, you know, for people to, and we had to wear track suits as, as well and, and go and talk and, and do public awareness and education during that time. So even our exercising time was limited because we wanted to send the message across because you will get people, you know, um, gathering there, you know, in numbers. Um, some of them don't even know how to exercise. I mean, we had a ca case there where one, this one lady was so furious that apparently this one guy sneezed um, on his face and on her face and she was not sure whether she got the corona or not. She had to go and test at that time. So even fights um, started sparking up in the, in the area. So we had to barricade the whole area um, and force people to leave around eight o'clock because uh, we know that the time limit is nine, six until nine, but at eight o'clock we just had to say, look, move um, from the area. You can still talk up until nine o'clock, but you must just move from the lookout area. That's how, how we managed to, you know, sort of disband them, not to be in one one place. So people started scattering around and having, you know, talk. But one thing that we was interesting as well was that we, we in that area there are coaches, you know, um, who are paid to <laughs> to gather people, so there can be those trainings or exercises. So this was one group of coaches that were refusing to move from the area, you know, because once you remove them, then they won't get money on that day. So, but we had to enforce the law at the same time and say, look, rather you move because some of you sneeze or cough and we are not sure. And, you know, 80% was not even wearing masks during that time. So it was a partnership after all amongst leaders from the community um, police and then metropolis, we called in metropolis, you know, and we were joined by paramedics as well for response. But it has been, you know, a good um, outcome. People don't gather there anymore. The pandemic has impacted the mental well-being of many people coping with social isolation and the economic impact of the virus. Voice of America interviewed a woman who hasn't been able to work for 15 years due to debilitating mental health problems and explored how the health system is supporting those with mental health illnesses during this period. As COVID-19 ramps up in South Africa, hospitals are seeing more patients suspected of having the virus, but the pandemic is also causing an increase in the number of mental health related problems due to the pandemic. While clinics and hospitals are open, very few of them still pay attention to current mental health care users during this time. And also there is no screening for mental health during COVID-19 screening and testing. Experts warn the nation's health care system is underfunded. Now we are in the pandemic and you're finding uh, yourself sort of on the back foot uh, with an already, already fragile system and not knowing how to go about fixing it. But, but knowing this, knowing that, you know, um, it is a, um, a poorly resourced, poorly distributed system. Critics say only few can get the mental health care they need due to the lack of resources. In South Africa, only 5% of the national budgets, of the national health budget, goes towards mental health services. Experts say the global pandemic has left many unsure about what lies ahead. There's all this anxiety around unknown factors that, that's out of our control. Um, people will often catastrophize and imagine the worst possible outcome. Wendy Jones, an anxiety sufferer, says she needs mental health assistance. 
I personally feel more anxious. I get really worried. And where, who do I go to? I, am I on the right medication? Should my medication be increased? I don't know these things. I need somebody to tell me. You trust, your trust in the medical system as it is should be, compl should be complete. It should be absolute, but it isn't. South Africa has been through similar health crisis before, and studies show the impact is lasting. There will be some long-lasting effects on, your, on, the, on the psyche and the mental health state of, of, of the population, based on what has happened before. Um, we've had SARS, we've had MERS, we've had Ebola, and all of these have required some sort of uh, lockdown or some sort of quarantine to take place. And studies emerging from that have found out that this has had uh, a detrimental impact on, on, on people's uh, mental health state. Experts say they worry this time the mental health care system will not be able to meet the demand in months to come. Franco Puglisi for VOI News, Johannesburg, South Africa. That's all from the news run, but when we get back, Stephanie Pitt will share what's trending on Twitter today. With the speed in which the coronavirus spreads, citizens are urged to adhere to social to COVID-19 regulations such as social distancing and regularly washing their hands. The following PSA takes you through seven important steps on how you can stay safe during this pandemic. Please follow our seven steps to help prevent the spread of COVID-19. No face mask, no entry. You should always wear a face mask when you come into a public building like this one to help contain the spread of COVID-19. Don't stand too close to other people. Please stand at least 1.5 meters away from other people. Follow the floor markers for physical distancing. Go through temperature screening. As a precautionary measure, all staff and visitors are required to go through temperature screening. Remove your gloves upon entering this building. You should follow strict hand washing and sanitization procedures. Use hand sanitizer. You can use your own sanitizer or wet wipes in the presence of security personnel only if there is proof that these have at least 70% alcohol concentration. Only three people are allowed inside the lifts. Staff or visitors who are fit and younger are encouraged to use the stairs. Wash your hands with soap for 20 seconds. You should always use soap and water to wash your hands after using the bathroom. Scrub your hands for at least 20 seconds. Let's continue to stay safe and stay at home. Together, we can beat this. Let's take a look at the popular hashtags on Twitter today. Hashtag SANDF. The military has exonerated those the court ruled were responsible for the death of Collins Causa. Meanwhile, Parliament's Portfolio Committee on Defence and Military Veterans says South Africa's Defence Force was fast losing its capabilities owing to successive budget cuts. Hashtag Dudu. Former President Jacob Zuma's close friend and head of his foundation, Dudu Mieni, has been declared by court to be a delinquent director for life. Mieni was the last chairperson of South African Airways. We'd like to know your views on burning issues during this pandemic, so we'll be posting burning questions on our Facebook page daily, Our City CT. You can also follow us on Twitter at Our City CT. That's it from me, Stephanie Pitt. Please stay with us as after the break, Michaela Miller will be giving you information on resources and places of safety you can access during this period.
Welcome back. You're still tuned into our city, The COVID Show, on Cape Town TV, Channel 263. For your latest news around the COVID-19 pandemic and to see what other Cape Tonians are doing to keep safe, tune into Cape Town TV daily. These are some organizations helping communities stay safe during this period. We have now come to the end of the Tuesday edition of the Our City COVID-19 News Show, but we will continue giving you the latest news on what's happening in Cape Town on our Facebook page at Our City CT and on Twitter at Our City CT. You can also get in touch with us via email on ourcity at capetowntv.org. That's all for us today. Enjoy your afternoon.